Um, I'm Sarah Pacini, I'm the Assistant Director of the Lackawanna Historical Society. Um, thank you all for tuning in with us here today. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Colonel Cullum, who is a graduate of the 1880, 1833 class of West Point and an aide-de-camp to General Winfield Scott. So I'll turn the program over to him. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My, my name is Colonel George W. Cullum, and I am the aide-de-camp to the Commanding General of the, of the Armed Forces of the United States. And at this time, it is my high honor and distinct privilege to introduce to you the Commanding General of the Armed Forces of the United States, Lieutenant General Winfield Scott. Thank you, Colonel. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Good Hello. afternoon, sir. I don't know how it is in the Scranton area, but up here at the point, it's very cold today. A brisk wind coming off of the Hudson, but I wanted to take this opportunity to share with you a few of the highlights of my life. I've had a very, very fulfilling and interesting life, and I have been credited by more than a few, including uh, Arthur Wellesley, a good friend of mine over in England, who you might know as either the Iron Duke or the Duke of Wellington as being the greatest general of the 19th century. I take that compliment very, very well coming from Arthur. I was born down in the South, down in uh, Dowinney, Virginia. I was born to my father and mother's plantation on Laurel Branch in 1787. I went on to attend classes in the practice of law at the College of William and Mary down in Williamsburg. But I always knew that my true love would rest with the Army. My father having served under General Washington during the Revolution. In 1809, there was a general sense in the country that the British were acting up to no good again. And I had to get into that fight. I knew that it was coming and I just had to be a part of it. And I went to my deceased father's good friend, a fellow by the name of Jefferson, who happened to be serving as president. And he gave me a commission as Colonel of Artillery and assigned me to New Orleans. Well, that didn't last too long because I got in quite a fight with the hierarchy in the army in New Orleans and was court-martialed. I spent a year in court-martial, but finally convinced the army that it was an error and I was reinstated. However, to this day, I'm a little upset that they never gave me reimbursement pay uh, for the time that I was uh, out of the army. Well, very shortly thereafter, as you know, we had a war in 1812. By that time, I was assigned to the Niagara campaign. And I very quickly ended up being captured by the British, only to be swapped in, a, in an officer swap later that year. I was very upset with that, and therefore I went to the Battle of Chippewa and very quickly dispatched a superior force of Redcoats. For that, I gained my first star as Brigadier General. Shortly thereafter, we found ourselves in another sticky wicket, as the British would say, and we were at the Battle of Lundy's Lane. I incurred a wound on my left arm, which I carried with me until the day that I ended up here at West Point forever. However, we again defeated a far superior force at Lundy's Lane. And for that, I received my second star. Now, mind you, I'm only in my 30s. But the youngest major general in the American Army. As time went on, I served 
various presidents, 14 of them in all, most of them that I didn't agree with because they, uh, they lacked so much. But that's for me to say. Anyway, we went through the Seminole Wars. And in 1830, we had a president elected, as you all will remember, as Jackson. He was not a nice man. Very, very not a nice man. He enacted what was called the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which basically took land and holdings from Native American Indians and forced them out to the Oklahoma Territory. The Supreme Court stepped in and said that's unconstitutional. These people are now Americans. Jackson's reply to the Supreme Court was, I have an army to back me up. What do you have? The man should have been impeached, as all of you know. And he should have been out of office at that point. However, he carried the day. <clears throat> and I happened to be put into command of the force that was to remove what were known as the friendly tribes from down in the south out to Oklahoma. I was not happy over this because I happened to feel that these people were, were American. There were doctors, there were lawyers, merchants, landowners. But I was ordered to do that, and I reluctantly agreed until I got to know a man by the name of John Ross. Now, John Ross, you'll see, was the chief of the Cherokee Nation, a college graduate. His offices were right down the street from me in Washington City. And I got to become very, very friendly with John Ross. And as all of you know, when you don't want to do something, you can find many ways not to do it. Cherokee became the last nation that had a move. And it was under the, the influence of Jackson's Puckett Van Buren that I was ordered to either move the tribe or face court martial. I met with Chief Ross and he asked simply that his own people be allowed to handle the move. Also asked that wagons be provided for the elderly, the infirmed, and the children, which I agreed to. I went down south to personally escort the Cherokee, but was ordered back to Washington City by Van Buren, who later I found out was at the insistence of Jackson. For most of Van Buren's presidency, I believe strongly, gentlemen and ladies, that Jackson ran the Van Buren presidency from the Hermitage, and that Van Buren was nothing more than a stooge for President Jackson. However, life went on. We went through several other wars. We went through the Black Hawk War. I remember uh, a lieutenant serving under me in the Black Hawk War. Not a very, very good leader, I have to admit. Uh, but uh, he was chosen by his men to be their lieutenant. And I wasn't going to argue with the men. And, and I know that the reason they picked him was he would let them do whatever he wanted or they wanted. His name was Lincoln. He was from Illinois. As time marched on, we found ourselves in the nullification problem down, believe it or not, South Carolina. I had to go down there and, and put the people straight that there wasn't going to be any nullification or else we would have to bombard them. That time it worked. Later, as you know, it would not work. 
However, by 1841, I had risen in the ranks to become general, commanding general in Washington City. In 1846, war broke out with Santa Ana down in Mexico, and uh, General Taylor led the Army of the North, and I attacked Mexico in the south, landing at Veracruz. I was very fortunate to have several young graduates of the point. Uh, names you'll remember later on in history, such as Lee, Hunt, McDowell, Grant, Meade. Very talented people, especially Lee. Robert Lee was from a very notable family down in my home state of Virginia and showed absolutely magnificent leadership capabilities. We defeated Santa Ana and took Mexico City in 1848 and, uh, after a, an interesting time as Governor General of Mexico at a time when several Mexicans attempted to have me installed as their <laughs> emperor. Uh, it was time to leave. I came back to Washington City only to find out that I had been disgraced and removed from my position in the Freemasons. They tried to take back the ceremonial sword that they presented to me for taking Mexico because they found that I had been attending services on Sunday at the Mexican Catholic Cathedral. They failed to realize that I had a tough job in Mexico and that I had to bring about the acceptance of those people to me as their enforced leader. One way I thought of doing that was to move among them and to try to practice their ways, and it did work out well. Shortly after I got back to Washington City. I moved to New York. I had a beautiful brownstone in New York, and I, uh, I loved to party in New York. There was no place better to party than New York. However, it was short-lived because as tensions grew between the rogue states in the South, President Buchanan asked me to return to, uh, to Washington City. And shortly thereafter, there was a little problem called the Pig War. And the Pig War broke out up at Puget Sound. One of our uh, patriots had shot a pig. It was a nice pig. It was a beautiful pig. And he thought it would be very well in his stomach. However, the pig happened to be the prized possession of the managing director of the Hudson Bay Company. And he got quite incensed and went to the British commandant in charge up there and yeah, now they were going to start a war. So Buchanan sent me up there and I was able to to quell that disturbance without one shot being fired. I arranged a meal between the colonel of the British forces and myself. And suffice to say, the only casualty of that war uh, was the pig that he and I devoured. Shortly thereafter, I was given a gold medal by the Congress for my work in Mexico and named General in Chief of All Armed Forces. I was the last individual to hold that post because after my retirement, it was broken up with Admiral Farragut and uh, General, uh, gee, I hate to mention his name, McClellan. Uh, a big mistake by, by Lincoln there with McClellan. But anyway, I'll get to that later. As the war started to take, or the conflict started to take significance, 
I went to Buchanan. I said, you know, you've got a problem here. I said, you've got my boss, the Secretary of War, who at the time was Jefferson Davis. Every time I would try to fortify our post, in the south, Davis would countermand and send those fortifications to the south. I knew what he was doing, and I think most people in the army knew what he was doing. So when Sumter came about, it, it was no great shock to me that they were able to handily defeat us in that brief encounter. I went to President Lincoln and I offered to him that at my age, at that time I was in my late 70s, I was suffering from dropsy, terrible gout. My weight had ballooned to 390 pounds. And I opined to him that I did not think I was able to lead my troops in battle anymore. I therefore recommended a young man who I told you about just recently in the Battle of Mexico, who later became superintendent of the point, and that was Colonel Robert E. Lee. My chief of staff, Colonel Townsend, was dispatched to find Lee and bring him to my offices at the War Department. Once I got there, and Lee got there, I offered him command of all Union forces. I knew with his expertise, this could end in very, very short order. Lee went on to give me some lame excuse about losing his properties across the Potomac place called uh, the Custis Lee Plantation. And uh, he said that had he accepted my proposal, his family would have been completely cut off from their funding, their properties, and therefore he had to re respectfully uh, decline. Well, the first thing, as you know, that I did was to send troops, uh, General Weitzel, was in charge of uh, Washington City defenses. I had sent General Weitzel across the river to the Potomac to seize the Lee home. Very simply because cannon shot from the Lee home could very easily land in the living room of President Lincoln's home. Took it over and eventually agreed to a great plan to ensure that Lee would never ever again set foot in that property by burying the dead in his wife's rose garden and all around the mansion. Later became, I understand, uh, Arlington National Cemetery. As you know, the first real battle of the Civil War, of the war between the states, took place at Manassas. I had sent what I thought was a, a good enough contingent under the direction of a General McDowell down to Manassas, and he quickly had his rear end kicked back to Washington. Uh, we, we lost, as you know, and I felt personally responsible for that loss. I tendered my resignation to President Lincoln in October of 61, he responded by accepting my resignation as general in chief, but not as a three-star general of the army. It was the first time, and to this day, as most of you know, that uh, generals never retire. They're always at the call of the president. I went on to retire up to West Point. Very shortly after my 
my wife, Virginia, who was living in Rome with our children, had succumbed. So I took another voyage over to Europe to retrieve her body. Landing in England and London, I was met by a contingent of British forces sent by Wellington at the behest of Queen Victoria. As it turned out, there were Southern saboteurs who were planning my <clears throat> abduction. I was urged to immediately return to my ship and to leave post haste. Eventually, Virginia's body was returned and it was buried up at West Point. I went on to write a two volume memoir and uh, it's just, just a magnificent work of literature. I have to admit myself, uh, no, nobody can do literature like I can do literature. I mean, it's just fantastic. And anyway, I continued to live at the point by 1862 there had been the greatly failed Peninsula campaign under McClellan. And uh, President Lincoln, in the company of General Polk, took the train to the point to meet with me on June 2nd. I was living at that point at Cozen's Hotel. And the president came to my rooms and we had a conference. I had to remind him that I tried to set him correct when I wanted Halleck, uh, another very, very well prepared general and someone who excelled in Mexico, uh, I had tried to tell the president he was the man to succeed me, but others uh, wanted that young whippersnapper to, to come in behind me and he did and failed. Uh, we agreed at that point on Halleck he made McClellan the general of the Army of the Potomac and went ahead and put Halleck back in charge. I believe, as I'm looking around the room here, uh, Mrs. Halleck is here someplace. I saw her briefly. Oh, there she is. Mrs. Halleck, it's very good to see you. My days at the point were good. I had adequate supplies. I had adequate staffing. Uh, as many at the point thought that I was the father of West Point, they 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 taught me or, or treated me with due respect. And as all of us uh, come, there's a day of reckoning, and on the 28th of May, in 1866 under the presidency of Andrew Johnson, uh, I succumbed. It was interesting because as I did, at my bedside were General Meade, General Schofield, General Grant, and actually my attendant. And I remember my last words to my attendant, or even though I never rode him, take care of my horse. I ended up with what I believe to be a stellar career in the service. Uh, I certainly won almost every battle. There was one, as I remember, a little side note. A young man at about, I believe he was 12 or and invited me to a game of chess. Now, naturally, I excel at chess. Nobody does chess better than I do. Uh, it's, it's a grand, grand uh, sport game. And uh, it, it's just, it's a remarkable game. And I do it the best. I mean, no, but nobody, nobody can quite touch the way I uh, play chess. This young man had the audacity to beat me in a game of chess. Well, I gave him a thing or two, I'll tell you right now. 
Turned out he later joined the Army and, and thanked me. That was my career in a nutshell. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> On that very appropriate note there, um, thank you very much for your time, General, for your sharing your sharing your story with us. Thank you all for, for tuning in. Uh, please keep an eye on your email and on our Facebook page for the password and the Zoom meeting ID for next week. Uh, next week, we'll be continuing our trip back in time, and we'll be joined by Louisa May Alcott. So, uh, please tune in hey, next Friday at 2 o'clock.